In many situations, when private equity comes calling, the owners of the practice are close to retirement and they're offered more money than they'd ever get from another physician buying into the practice. Now, my practice has been approached by private equity twice, and I'm in my early 40s, so nowhere near retirement. So the decision to sell is a lot more complicated. Ultimately, we didn't sell, but while negotiations were taking place, I was concerned. And I wasn't even sure if my concerns were valid or if I was even considering the issues that I should be concerned about. Private equity was recently a topic of conversation on ENT Connect, which is the American Academy of Otolaryngology's chat room. So I invited two of the physicians who had given eloquent, concise arguments for and against selling onto the show to discuss their reasoning. It made for a very informative conversation. William Blythe is a general otolaryngologist practicing at East Alabama Ear, Nose, and Throat in Auburn, Opelika, Alabama. He's been in the same practice with the same partners since finishing residency in 1997. He was the past chief of staff at East Alabama Health, where he served in almost every medical staff leadership position over the past 24 years. He served as the president of the Alabama Society of Otolaryngology for 10 years and continued in his role as annual meeting coordinator. He continues to serve on multiple committees for the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, including CPT, AMPC, Regent Executive Committee, and is currently the Senior Director for Private Practice, Board of Directors, and Board of Director Executive Committee. This is why he had two Zoom meetings before this interview and probably one after. Dr. Drew Lacandro is a practicing general otolaryngologist with Northwest ENT and Allergy, Marietta, Georgia. He joined a group practice after, in Georgia after residency in Albany, New York, and has practiced there ever since. He's president of his six-physician group with five office locations and an ASC. He served as chairman of the Department of Surgery at Wellstar Kennesaw Hospital, as well as chair of the Hospital Quality Assurance Committee for several years. He's also been a member of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Outcomes Research and Evidence-Based Medicine Committees. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. It's story time, brought to you by locumstory.com. Today, we'll be reading Docs in Shocks. Some docs are overworked as work works overworked workers weary. Some docs are overstocked, stopped as pandemic TikToks keep docs off clocks. If docs are in shock as the pandemic clock TikToks, then locum is the token to unburn the burnt out broken. So how many clock TikToks must talk until docs tick box and swaps to the spoken locum tenens token to unburn the burnt out broken. Enough ticks have talked. The time is now, and locums is how. Locum tenens tends to trend as a godsend, mend to burnt out ends. For more locum tenens information, go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash locum story. It's your final destination. Dr. Drew Lacandro and Dr. William Blythe, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for this opportunity and talk about a timely topic that our ENT colleagues need to know about. So, Drew, let's start with you because you moved forward with the private equity deal. So I'd like you to give us a, a summary of why you decided to approach them or when they approached you, why you were receptive. What were your reasons for considering it? And also, what were your trepidations going into it? And why did you ultimately decide to consummate the deal? Sure. That's a long question, but I'll try to address it briefly and succinctly. So I'm in my early 60s. I'm a president of actually our group of now six docs. We're in Metro Atlanta. I moved here from New Jersey in 1989, joined the group at that time. And then 1998, our group at that time joined with a practice management company called Atlanta ENT. And that was a New concept at that time, there were some other venture capital companies that were out that were merging physician groups and multi-specialty groups. The model was different. We thought it made sense. We joined amongst many other docs in the Atlanta area up to 30 at one point. 
And it didn't work out. I mean, it seemed like on paper it worked, it seemed logical. It was an acquisition. We were all going to work together and build practices. But due to the structure and the way the incentives were aligned, it didn't really work that well for physicians. So that model kind of disintegrated shortly thereafter. And it was quiet for many, many years. So we actually regrouped and I formed a group of two, then three physicians. We're up to six at this point. A couple of years ago, now we joined our partner two and a half years ago, but just prior to that, things started to get very complex. We running a business in medicine is complicated these days. It's time consuming, it's demanding, there's risk. And we found that the cost kept escalating. So our overhead kept increasing over and over. And we're in a competitive market. We have multiple offices. We've got a surgery center. We've got some ancillary services. All those are running, but it kind of gets burdensome and you can't just pass it off to a third party or to your practice administrator. As physicians and owners, we need to be involved. So got to the point where we started to really look for other options. I heard through in my county medical society that private equity was back into the market, acquiring different specialties, for example, dermatology, orthopedics, and urology, and ophthalmology. So we contacted one of the firms that had organized a group of ophthalmologists in Atlanta and had some long discussions. And we decided to go ahead and merge with a partnership with a private equity firm. So we've done that. It's been two and a half years and overall it's been a very positive experience and we can get into that in a little bit. As you were going through the deal with them, what were you hesitant about? Well, we were hesitant about overhead. Was that overhead being passed on to the physicians? And in this model, it's not. We were hesitant certainly about experience and dedication and the integrity of the partner and also the incentives of the partner. And so we looked at that carefully. We met with the private equity firm, which happens to be based in Chicago. We liked what they had to present. They have tremendous amount of experience in the microcap health field. Microcap means medical businesses anywhere from two to ten million dollars in gross revenue, and they've had multiple models that they've successfully acquired and even brought to exit in the marketplace. So strong track record, good people. We liked the model that was presented. It was very different from that model back in the late 90s. And that's why we chose to move forward. Bill, can you tell us about your experience? Because as it turns out, it was the same PE firm that approached you, correct? Yes. And my group has actually spoken to three different firms, but I am familiar with Drew's group and um, that PE group and had some lengthy discussions and negotiations with them. I apologize. I don't want you to necessarily have to disclose what was going on with those groups. But, you know, if you've been approached by three different groups, then let's go through this similar question. What would be the reasons why you have considered them? And ultimately, what were the reasons why you decided not to? So they've approached us. So we haven't sought it out yet. Although I've been to plenty of meetings and I've talked to people and, you know, we read and respond to emails. I'm just one of those guys. I'm always, you know, whatever you're selling, if you send me an email, I'm going to click on it. I'm going to see if I'm interested in it and I may click through it. But you have to remember that true private practice, independent practices are are not the majority of our specialty anymore. And if you look at the entities that know, for example, physical, that the group that sells balance systems to offices, you know, they'll tell you that only about a third of practices and otolaryngologists in the country right now are in true private practices. The supply is becoming shorter and shorter. We're a true independent practice, and we've had several people that have talked to us. We've gone farther down the road with some groups and the others on those discussions. But, you know, I'm always interested, and I remain interested to this day, of hearing what people have to say. We've been approached by our local hospital to purchase our group on several occasions. We've been approached by a local university to join with the university and their network. You know, so people are always in these discussions. And I think that that is a very common part of private practice. You know, we're in a discussion right now with two different ACOs and with the CIN. People are always looking to expand their networks and all in private equity is just the sort of contemporary iteration of that. I mean, we're very interested and I remain interested. But not interested enough to consummate a deal. And I want to be very clear about this. I'm never going to say never. There's a lot of, you know, medicine changed dramatically just in the 24 years that I've been in practice. There's a lot of pressures, particularly on a small group. Now, you got to remember, Drew and I practice in very different contexts. 
I'm in draw for my practice is about 350,000 people. And where, I don't know how many is in Metro Atlanta, Drew, what is it, 8 million? There's a lot of people there. We have no competition. And we have a single hospital that provides care for seven counties surrounding us. And so we have a single institution. We have no competition. We're the only ENT group in town. And it's a very different context than the world that Drew practices in. Everything is, in my opinion, and should be contextual. And in Drew's context, this might have been the most sensible solution or option at the time that they made the choice. For us right now, it's just not selling our practice to any entity, whether that's a hospital, whether that's a system, or whether that's private equity has not been advantageous enough for us to make that decision. One of the questions that I wanted to talk about for the issues is the potential existential threat to private practice. Is this way of practicing being threatened by the coalescing of larger groups, larger practices, multi-specialty groups, such that we'd be worried about our referrals drying up. So for you, Bill, that would be the hospital hiring their own ENTs, right? They hire their own ENTs and you're going to lose a big referral source there. Does that concern you? Does that give you maybe a drive towards selling either to the hospital or to private equity as a hedge against changes in the future? I'll take this one first. I would be delighted to go into another two-hour podcast for this very discussion at another time that doesn't even mention private equity. So I want to go ahead and say this. I don't think that private equity in and of itself is an existential threat to private practice or general otolaryngology, but I do have severe concerns and a lot of heartache and a lot of attention focused on what I do think is an existential threat to both general otolaryngologists and to private practice. And personally, I think that they're both worth saving. I think that, you know, most trainees are choosing to do fellowship training. Most people are choosing to go into an employment model of some type, whether that's institutional employment, academic medicine, hospital employment, or larger group employment. And I hate to see it. I I just hate to see it. I'm a staunch advocate of independent practice. I'm a staunch advocate of of general otolaryngology. I think that our, I think the people that make it into ENT and that we have trained in the past half century are some of the brightest, most wonderful people in all of medicine. And I like to see us uh, doing, so, so that's just my side. I'm highly concerned about the existence of private practice in general otolaryngology. There's very few practices like mine left where we're completely independent of all facilities. We don't have any financial relationship with any hospitals, with any institution. We have three general otolaryngologists, and we do everything from, we we don't do acoustics, we don't do free flaps. But other than that, we do everything in ENT. And I think we do it reasonably well, but that's just very rare this day and time. So I think that there are lots of existential threats. I think PE is one of them. I don't think it's necessarily a bad one of them. It's just, it's no worse or no better than academics or hospitals. I didn't really mean PE itself as being the existential threat, but PE as being a hedge against that as existential threat. So a financial hedge. So you see the possibility of your hospital hiring other otolaryngologists so that your referrals dry up. And in order to protect yourself and your family financially, you will therefore sell to private equity to make sure that you are still financially stable. Let me just comment on private equity. I mean, their goal is to invest and build. Their goal is to make us better. It's to give us professional support. Yes, it's acquisition, bring other practices in within the bigger umbrella, but they are very intent on maintaining your practice identity that we know that's vitally important. It's how we get referrals, how we're known, how our phone number is. It doesn't help if there's another group on the other side of Atlanta and all of a sudden we become some new name that nobody knows about. So they know to maintain the integrity and the strength. And frankly, I think it increases the legacy and the strength of that practice because now you've got an incredibly strong financial partner that's going to invest a lot of capital, a lot of expertise to support and build that practice. But you're right. I personally see it. There was a threat to continue where I'm in a very competitive market, unlike Bill, surrounded by big hospital systems that employ multiple otolaryngologists. I mean, when I first started, I was the busiest doc in my local hospital. Now they have 
seven full-time employed ENT doctors and Lord knows how many advanced practitioners. So that's one of the reasons why we had to be aggressive and bring in other offices in the surrounding region so we could buffer our referral base against a monopoly. So hedging with a strong partner, I think, increases, if you will, the legacy role of a private practice and also helps build the young doc. So a young doc comes in and he knows that he's got strong support and that carries through to the future because that's what private equity, they're looking for the future. There are some of that model is to look at that second exit, but many private equity firms actually retain ownership within the business because they know that medical practices do well in the long term. So you talk about the legacy. What would you tell a resident is coming to interview you to be hired by the practice? Mm-hmm. And they ask you, what's the difference between what it was like practicing before the sale and what it's like practicing after the sale? What would you tell them? Our day-to-day practice hasn't changed one bit. If anything, we have some more support. Yes, I have more ancillary support, more IT support. Now when the computer breaks, I have three people that are instantly on top of it. So yeah, but as far as day-to-day running the practice, seeing our patients, going to the OR, doing rounds, consults, all our services in the office have not changed one bit. My schedule hasn't altered at all. In fact, if anything, we're busier. Why? Because they pour a lot of money into marketing. So now we have more finances dedicated to internet marketing. We now have a practice liaison, which we never had before. So there's a full-time person whose job is just to go around in the greater Northwest Atlanta suburbs, and even in the city, knock on referral doors, urgent care centers, primary care centers. Here's some docs cards. You need to get an ENT doc. We can get them in quickly. If anything, it's been a positive experience, as I mentioned for us. Without getting into specifics, is there any difference in compensation for a new hire before versus after? No, the salaries are competitive. They're the same. I mean, if anything, maybe a little bit better that a new ENT guy could get in a hospital or certainly in a private practice. Probably the biggest difference is the fact that by joining a group like ours, any doc has the opportunity for equity. That is when it becomes time to become partner rather than writing a check for me or any other senior doc and who knows what that price is and what you'll get out of it in the end when I retire. Now, the, the, the equity firms usually do a shared opportunity for equity that is shares within, this, within the firm itself. And that investment by track record is way better than you're going to get by just buying into a, a general practice. Yeah, that's the second bite that they refer to when they eventually right. sell to a larger private equity firm or or a healthcare system. Yeah, usually a usually mid cap, as I mentioned, yeah. the model starts as a micro cap and then they go up to mid cap and then maybe even larger after that. So aside from financial gain, right? Because this is what, what at least when they were approaching us, they were saying, you're going to get this money up. Front. Some of it you're going to get as cash. Some of it you're going to get as an investment in the practice itself. So that when we grow your practice and eventually sell it to a larger private equity firm, you're going to make a multiple on this other investment. So there's this potential for financial gain there. At least the way of describing it to us was they were also going to take some of that income, but in some instances, as a management fee. But in some instances, they're able to improve your income through economies of scale and through better contracts with insurers. So by growing the groups, you've got these advantages. So aside from financial gain, are there other issues contributing to quality of life that we need to consider when we're selling, right? Drew, we'll start with you. What were the factors unrelated to compensation and you know the second bite that you were considering as I mentioned, complexities of running a business. I mean, in 2021, every year we get more regulatory rules, more complicated contracts to negotiate, more, you name it from top to bottom, IT to marketing to competition. So, you know, credentialing, the compliance issues. So we would have meetings and I would have to go to meetings after work on Monday evenings or noon meetings or 7 a.m. meetings with my administrator, my partners, with vendors, with no negotiating equipment leases, loans for leases for equipment. So all that is no longer my responsibility. Now, yes, I oversee, I get a lot of questions. Is this the right thing to do? But the beauty is I have a lot more free time now and I don't have to deal with a lot of this. 
And the model that we're in now, overhead is not passed on to any of the physician. Our compensation model is frankly, it's a percentage of, of revenue. So it doesn't matter how many staff the company adds or how much overhead they add, if you will. And that to me was the huge difference from the group that we were involved with many years ago. But Bill, you're still running your practice. So the question is, are physicians more satisfied when we own the practice, which may be more fulfilling, but have more work running it versus just being able to put our heads down, see our patients and go home? Yeah, you know, I really think that somebody really needs to do a good thoughtful study on that because the honest answer is, I don't know. My gut experience and my thought on it and from what I think I have read is that people that own their own practices are generally have less burnout and are generally happier and have higher compensation. I may be wrong about that, but I think I'm pretty sure if you look at the data on burnout, and all that it's actually lower if you own your own practice. And I think that's true for anything. I think the one thing that Drew said that really got my attention, he said, I have more free time. I mean, who's not interested in more free time? And your time is your most valuable asset. Once you cross over 50, especially, you know, time is precious. And so I think everybody's interested in that. And that certainly is an intriguing part of it. You know, we have a relatively small practice. We have six providers, three doctors, three APPs, four audiologists, 32 employees total. So we're a much smaller group than certainly your group is, Braden and, and Drew's as well. But, you know, I don't find running the business to be that arduous. I like having the control of it. Speaking at the academy meeting, I think a lot of people have this idea of a small private practice like mine as some guy in a lab coat sitting over a whale oil lamp, balancing the books with a quill and throwing shillings to the employees. We have a full-time, again, we have a full-time practice manager that's out of Gainesville, Florida, doctors management. They manage thousands of doctors. They're very good at it. They oversee our books. Payroll is very, very easy and inexpensive to outsource. We have the same EHRs that big groups do. You know, so I don't find managing the practice to be that arduous. Yeah, you have to answer a bunch of emails and you have to, you know, keep your attention on it, but nobody watches your money like you do. I don't find it to be that arduous and I actually find it to be quite satisfying. Drew, what was your experience when you were running the practice of what you can outsource and should outsource and what you should keep to yourself, what you should be managing? Well, sure. You can outsource almost any function of a medical practice. There's more than enough companies willing to take a fee for doing that. One of our biggest issues was revenue cycle management and Really, are we collecting? Are we billing properly? Are we coding properly? Part of it was the EMR system. We are in a network with one of the hospital systems. We're not owned by any ways, but there we have to use this EMR and the accounting system. And it's not the easiest system to get data out. So we always were struggling. And, you know, we're always, should we hire more staff? Should we not hire more staff? And I can tell you, once we merged, we had, let's see, I think we had four staff that were involved in a revenue cycle. When we joined the private equity group, they bumped that staff up to seven and we saw a significant increase in our collections. Nothing else changed, same amount of work. We were up at about an 18% increase in net collections. That's just by having more staff, more people. And we weren't sure we weren't willing to pay for that. So You know, what you don't know, you don't know sometimes, but that was probably the biggest change that we were able to see. And that's reproducible and easily, we could prove that. Bill, for yourself, aside from what you already mentioned, what do you think is critical for practices to outsource? What should they hold on to and manage themselves? I think you do blocking and tackling in-house. I mean, you you need somebody in-house that reviews every remit that goes out and every EOB that comes in. You need your basic revenue cycle management to be in-house and you need to balance your own books. But it's also important to have checks and balance. Routine, regular accounting work is easily outsourced to an accountant and payroll, that can be outsourced to really anybody. Those are relatively easy. You still have to have somebody on site that's going to manage your personnel. You still need somebody who's reasonably savvy with HR. I do think that You know, our group, we really benefit from an outside practice management group that oversees our books and that reviews it every month and runs an analysis. And the other advantage of that is that they're not just doing ENT. They can look at us and they can say, look, your AR is running 24 days. We think you need to lean that up, try to get it down below three weeks. They know how many full-time equivalents each provider should have and how much you should pay for them. When we hire an audiologist, you know, we don't do that in-house. We have our consultant say what an average audiologist 
should make and what sort of compensation models there are that seem to be most profitable. So I think it's good to have some things in-house, but also have outside consultants. It's also really, really important for anybody who's listening out there, private practice, really, really important to make sure that your staff is not stealing from you. That happens all the time. If you don't know a doctor in private practice who has had somebody steal from them, you just don't know many doctors. It happens all the time. So it's good to have an outside person that's auditing your books and looking over and reconciling the bank accounts every month. And I think that's all important. This is the end of part one of my conversation with Dr. William Blythe and Dr. Drew Lacandro about sale of private practice to private equity. Stay tuned for part two. For doctors, the story has changed. Visit drpodcastnetwork.com slash locum story for unbiased information about locum tenens and see if it should be your next chapter. And remember, locum tenens tends to trend as a godsend men to burnt out ends. Everything in this podcast is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, and we are not providing medical advice. No physician-patient relationship is formed, and anything discussed in this podcast does not represent the views of our employers. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.